Yay, it works. Hey everyone, welcome to the Upstream Development Lightning Talks. Yay! You all made it through. So, we're going to have some fun, exciting talks. I'm sure you've seen the lineup. It's looking pretty good. So, uh, let's go ahead and start with Lana. Yay! <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so, the story begins, as so many do, with an argument on a mailing list. Uh, in the olden days, around Mataka, uh, we only wrote and maintained installed documentation for what we used to call the DEF Core projects. So that's Nova, Glance, Keystone, Neutron, Cinder, Horizon, plus we had a couple of ring-ins. Uh, every so often, some other project would ask to be included, and we'd sort of go, mm, do you mind, could you just go off and do that in your own repo or something, please? Because we kind of had to draw a line somewhere. So, anyway, eventually somebody worked out that this wasn't a thing that was really cool, and so, of course, what it, the inev inevitable happened, and there was a bit of rant on a mailing list. So, being a good docs PTL that I am, I put on my big girl panties, and I waded right on into that mailing list thread. Uh, I didn't come away entirely unscathed, but, uh, you know, I did have a few battle scars, but we did actually have a plan. That was a good thing. So, the problem is that the big tent is not just big, it's huge. We have the best big tent. Uh, it, it, it's not getting any smaller either, that big tent keeps getting bigger. And uh, pretty much all these projects within the big tent want an install guide. So, but having an install guide is also part of the project navigator, so it's a way of being a grown-up project in OpenStack land. You need to have an install guide. So, at this point, I would like to acknowledge my co-conspirators. You know, I, can, I can see one. Um, so, while I was making sort of wild-eyed assumptions and, and throwing the proverbial at walls, uh, Tomiyuki Kato and Andreas Jago were behind the scenes uh, making sure it was all actually going to work and that the things that I was saying was, was actually a thing we could do. So, I appreciate that those guys did that, and I didn't even feel like hitting them, not even once. So, in ride these wonderful guys, uh, we get things set up in such a way that allows each and every project to write and maintain their own install guide in their own repo, and we publish it up to the docs website, and it looks exactly the same like all the others. Um, they sit alongside their core install guide. So, this is what we started referring to as treating each project as a first-class citizen, and it meant that we... Um, that became a core principle behind the changes we implemented. So we also wanted to try and make it as easy as possible for projects to be able to do this. So Andreas set up this really clever little tool. It actually is a little GitHub project by a woman called uh, Audrey Greenfeld. And it lets us set up this basic structure. It's called Cookie Cutter. It lets us set up this basic structure. And that means we get a consistent structure through each individual document, and it helps it to look uniform across the doc site. So in summary, as of the Newton release a couple of weeks ago, newcomers to OpenStack have a much clearer path to getting started. There's the basic core install guide, which gets all the underlying services installed, so things like your networking and your database and your compute services. From there, there's additional project-specific guides pick up from the base first step and build on those services. So what next? There's always more to be done. Uh, we need to keep on supporting various projects to write their guides. We also want to redesign the index page, because at the moment it's but ugly, so that's next. And uh, we also want to make it more user-friendly. We also want to get some other install methods documented. So we know from the user survey that most people install OpenStack using a tool, such as um, a Puppet or Ansible, and we'd love to see some guides on those tools get up there as well. We're going to redesign the site to make that really user-friendly for people to, to get at. It's also why we changed the name from being an install guide to being an install tutorial, because we understand that if you're installing things by hand, you're probably not doing that for a production system. You're doing it because you're trying to learn about what OpenStack is. Um, in summary, if you work on a project and you want an install guide, that is now a thing you can do. If you um, are a user, you're looking for install information, that is now something that's much easier for you to do, and everybody wins. Before I go, just real quick, before I get kicked off the stage, I'd also like to mention there is a super user article up on the website right now that explains all this in much more detail. It's not quite so quick and has all the links and everything and you can go and check it all out. And thank you. Ooh, speed demon. Now let me start, stop the timer. Okay, so we're gonna jump over now. Uh, God, did I say it right? I apologize, everyone. I'm horrible with names. So, um, and then on deck, we have Spencer. So, you're up. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Vipin. I contribute to the OpenStack Cinder project. 
So this talk is about troubleshooting uh, NOVA's inter API interaction failures by tracing uh, volume state transition from log files. Okay. Yeah, so um, NOVA calls inter APIs to perform various operations. Um, and these operations uh, result in change in volume state. For example, the attach API changes the volume state from attaching to in use. So uh, there are bugs in the interaction, and especially with the cleanup. And uh, because of those bugs, if something goes wrong, the volume state can be inconsistent between Nova and Cinder. Um, this inconsistency could uh, result in different kinds of bugs. For example, um, um, uh, the volume uh, cannot be deleted because it's attached uh, with no corresponding instance. And in another case, we cannot detach a volume because it's not attached at all. So in typical troubleshooting, we try to identify uh, the volume operation which failed from the log files, then uh, identify the volume operations, um, the successful volume operations leading to the one which failed, and then figure out what happened in NOVA um, during those successful volume operations. So this is time consuming. Um, so since these bugs are due to uh, volume state inconsistency, can we use volume state transitions to speed up the troubleshooting? So in my experience, we can use uh, volume state transitions to speed up uh, the troubleshooting. Uh, so uh, the, the problem uh, which motivated me to look into this approach was a bug report which says invalid volume, volume doesn't have any attachments to detach. So uh, someone tried to delete an instance and uh, Nova, tri Nova called uh, detach API on Cinder to detach any attached volumes and that detach call was failing. So I have a script which uh, generates volume state transition diagrams uh, from log files given a volume ID as an input. So uh, here we can see the uh, uh, volume state transition diagram of the volume in the bug report. So um, for each transition, we have the request ID and uh, the operation uh, responsible for that transition. So we can see that transition number eight is marked red because it's an invalid transition because it tried to detach a volume which is uh, it's already in available state. So we can see that transition number seven was a detached call and it was a successful one. So in Cinder, the detached call was successful, but Nova think that the volume is still attached. So something might have happened in Nova during transition number seven. So we can get more details about that transition using the same script. We can give the request ID and the volume ID as an input, so it prints the transition details of the requested transition and the previous one for more debugging context. So we have various info such as the request ID, the instance ID, and the timestamp. So using this um, info, we can uh, quickly identify relevant lines in Nova log files. So uh, this is what I found from the Nova log files um, uh, using the debugging info in the transitions. So we have the attached call, uh, and it was successful. And then um, in the third step, uh, the Nova instance um, spawn failed. And Nova tried to cl clean up the instance. Um, and as part of the cleanup, Nova called the detached call. And that detach was also successful. So then why, try, why Nova tried to detach the volume again? Because even when the detach was successful. So one possibility is that Nova did not clean up the volume related metadata after detach. So I looked into the code responsible for this uh, cleanup and I couldn't find any uh, destroy call on the BDM entry, which is the block device mapping uh, the volume metadata in Nova. And I think uh, that's the root cause of this bug. That's it, thank you. All right, thank you, Vipin. So let's go ahead. So we're gonna be hearing from Spencer. I'm gonna cancel that timer. And we have on deck Jeremy. Oh, and Matthew. Is Matt here? No, it's just me. Oh, okay. okay. In spirit. Do you need me to refresh? Refresh. Yeah, refresh. Okay. Hello, everyone. The uh, logo changed. Um, my name is Spencer Crum, and I work on the infrastructure team. And if there were no other hints, I work at IBM. Um, and this is a talk about VINs. So uh, Garrett is this thing that the infrastructure team runs that hopefully most of you have interacted with. And it's, it's very famous for being pretty ugly and terrible. Um, and 
Yep. So like Garrett is probably a really good example of like they got a great data structure, like the internal data structures are really solid, but like the UI is just bad. And so over the years, we've done a lot of things to try to make this better. A lot of people might not know this, but this little, the little, like the grid there showing you your test results, that's not in Garrett. That's actually something that Infra injects into JavaScript to make Garrett look less bad. Um, just as an idea. So there was this thing that came out of that, which was this idea we would write something called VINs, which was basically saying, well, Garrett has an API and good data structures. We'll use that as a, as a thing, as just an API service, and we'll write a UI that doesn't suck. Um, and this idea has come and gone several times. But eventually, I was like tired, and I decided I would try. So I tried. Um, and so you do the simple thing where you just have a web page that just you know, has the client go make requests against Garrett. Um, and that immediately fails because the cross-origin request signatures or whatever, the cores, uh, the same origin policy. Um, so you get to the point where you need to make requests from the Garrett service itself. And so uh, I don't actually know how to program JavaScript. And so what I did is I used uh, Grease Monkey to just inject some JavaScript into Garrett um, whenever it would load to a specific change. And I, I started deleting things and I played with the Garrett API until I could give a plus one vote and a minus one vote with some little events. I um, mean, at that point it was like kind of POCable. And I showed Greg and Greg was like, this, this, is, this is really, really bad. Um, and then we, we clicked around some more and we realized that, that there was a big security vulnerability in our Garrett that had been revealed by me screwing with Grease Monkey, so I'm totally calling it um, that that's always good from now on. Um, but then we go back to I don't actually know JavaScript, and uh, Hergler Burglar, um, Diana Whitman, um, shows up and says, hey, I know how to use this React.js stuff. Let's make a better Vince. And so we actually made uh, a thing that looks kind of not like poop. Um, that uses, uh, you can't really scroll up and down in this because it's a screenshot, but um, it's a, it's, a, it's a view of a, of a change that does not look super cluttered and is not all table driven and you can, you can look at it on your iPhone and your, and your tablet. Um, the title of this talk used the word viable, which is like not even remotely close. Um, but we did write it and uh, it's got a whole thing. Um, there are other people working on this, right? Like everyone hates this problem. So the Garrett developers themselves are using the Polymer framework from Google to rewrite the entire UI. Um, and that will be basically forced upon us the next time we Garrett upgrade. Or it, one of the future Garrett upgrades will be like, here's the new Polymer-based UI. I hope you hate this less. Um, uh, and then there's a group called OctoGarrett, which is basically just doing VINs, where they make it look a lot like GitHub. Um, if you'd like to get involved in the project, honestly, Diana left OpenStack. She was a Horizon dev at HP and then moved on to do other things. And then I don't really know JavaScript that well. But I would be, if anybody was super excited to work on it, like I would be happy to do it. We have a pound VINs on OpenStack or on Freenode. Um, and it's, it's kind of cool. You feel pretty sweet when you're like, I made this a little bit better. And we're actually like pretty close. Like if we wanted to, we could deploy it under review dev and have it be live enough for people to click on. So anyways, that's the project. Thanks for your attention and have a great summit. My name is Spencer Crum. Thank you. All right, we're gonna hear from just Jeremy, otherwise known as Fungi. Um, yeah, and then we're gonna be hearing from Corel, Stan, and Dimitri. So here we go. Sorry. As Mike says, I'm just Jeremy, um, but also known as Fungi. Uh, Matt Trainish is not here, obviously, but is here in spirit. And um, we originally proposed this talk together, so I'm going to try to uh, to represent his uh, his tenacity for this project as uh, much as I can. Um, so we want to talk about a an experimental. Uh, service that we've introduced into the community infrastructure recently, um, something that was a sort of a, a brainchild of Matt's and with the assistance of some of the rest of our developer community, um, we now have the fire hose running in our community infrastructure. Um, I always like to start out with a big complicated diagram of our community infrastructure, but I'm tired of adding them to slideshows. So imagine our massively complicated community infrastructure, and there are lots of services that have lots of transitions going on within them continuously as, as we perform testing of OpenStack 
changes and and provide wikis and mailing lists and and so on. Um, so the idea was to take an MQTT broker uh, and use it as a carrier for events within various pieces of community infrastructure. Um, we have uh, anonymous read-only access to this MQTT service on port 1883. Um, you can also do TLS, SSL uh, on 883 or 88, 8883. And um, there is some rudimentary WebSockets support. We had it running, but there's a libwebsockets bug that has caused us to temporarily disable it until we can rebuild against a uh, trunk version of libwebsockets. Um, so we kind of need to work through a little bit of that. Um, but basically, uh, for those of you unfamiliar with the protocol, MQTT is a, uh, a publisher and subscriber messaging protocol. Um, it was originally known as MQ Telemetry Transport. It's now an ISO IEC standard. Um, the, the protocol itself dates back to 99, so it's got a fair amount of history. Um, it's, it's basically a, a lightweight message queue design uh, designed for low bandwidth and, and low resource uh, utilization. Um, we are using Mosquito as the, uh, as the broker on the fire hose at the moment, and um, there's an example there of, of using the Mosquito utilities, um, which are basically just uh, you know command line subscription to the, the wild card topic in the fire hose if you wanted to really get the full effect of seeing all the events we're publishing in there right now, which uh, is a lot, but from a limited number of services so far. Um, as you can see here, the services that we are publishing into the fire hose, um, they're represented by various topic patterns, but we've got uh, a, a publisher called Garrett MQTT that Matt wrote that is publishing Garrett stream events, um, the same sort of stream events that Zool and Garrett bot are, are watching in our environment. Um, we've got uh, another uh, publisher he wrote called LP MQTT, which is uh, actually a mailbox subscribed to um, uh, launchpad projects receiving bug uh, status changes and then translating those into uh, MQTT events. And um, we've got a log stash outputter that is temporarily disabled because it's still a little bit uh, rough around the edges. But for people who want to kind of work on translating log stash uh, uh, entries into uh, MQTT, there's that. Um, they're all free software projects. Uh, within the infrastructure family of, of repos uh, for OpenStack. And um, so our future plans here, uh, we want to get uh, Garrett Bot using uh, something other than a direct connection to the Garrett stream. Uh, so the fire hose is a good option for that. There are plans in Zool v3. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with Zool's uh, current development uh, status, um, we would like to, after the V3 release, get uh, the ability for Zool to consume MQTT or some other messaging bus uh, as a stand-in for the Garrett event stream. Um, and then uh, some more publishers. We would kind of like our Ansible log uh, entries from changes that continually happen uh, for our configuration management to get dumped in there. Um, and uh, state changes in node pool so we can see node creation and, and deletion show up, um, and whatever you'd like to suggest. Uh, we're pretty much open to, to options here. Uh, this is an experimental service, as I said, so we're kind of just wanting to have people play with it and see what they think would be cool to add. Um, and uh, if you want more information, uh, you can reach us on the infra mailing list uh, or in the infra channel on Freenode, and um, I've got links there to the uh, system config documentation for how we manage the service, the spec that introduced it, uh, and also links to the home pages for the MQTT protocol and the Mosquito suite of applications. And that is it. Thank you very much. Thank you, just Jeremy. <laughs> okay, so Carell. just Corel. that's it. Um, and then on deck, we have Travis and Matt for Searchlight Horizon. So, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Grill. 
Uh, I'm a PDL of Murano for this cycle and the previous one. I also have here Stan. He's the actual author of Yakul, uh, the thing I'm going to talk about today. And Mitro, he's our, one of the best Murano apps uh, author. Um, so uh, today I'm going to talk about Yakul. And Yakul stands for yet another query language. I know that we're not good with naming things. Uh, so it's a small, neat uh, OpenStack library. It's actually on the requirements, so you can use it in your project. And you might want to use it in your project, or if you're a user of a project that already implements, uh, um, that already incorporates Yakul, say, Heat or Mistral, uh, you might want to know how, uh, how you can enhance your experience with, the, uh, with your project by knowing more about Yakul. Uh, so, yeah, Yakul is basically a query language that allows the, you to operate, make queries on arbitrary data. You have to supply some data, and then, yeah, then basically, uh, let me start a few, afresh. <laughs> so, uh, most of the projects, sooner or later, uh, operate on some kind of data, be it a heat template on uh, in the heat, or Murano operates on the... Um, uh, uh, object model in Murano or task graph and fuel. So in many cases, if not in all, you would like to extract some data from that uh, object model. You would like to transform it somehow, operate, uh, uh, make some uh, calculations or aggregations over it. Uh, so Yakul gives you the language and the tooling to embed the uh, expression language into your DSL uh, and operate on those data. Um, yeah, here's what the Yakul expressions actually look like. So you can, you can have some simple arithmetic, you can have some filters, you can have uh, some aggregation functions, and uh, imaginable examples of Yakul expressions can be, well, say, alarm conditions for monitoring systems, like uh, fire this alarm if half of the uh, servers are in some state. Uh, data mining, like, give me all the VMs uh, whose name starts with a certain prefix, or, for example, give me all the, the most used flavors, or the most used images, or, for example, give me the names of the users uh, who have heat stacks spawned two plus weeks ago, or stuff like that. So, for example, the, the, the one, two, three, four, the fourth one here is, well, it operates on an imaginary object model, but it kind of should give you uh, the top five most used images. Um, uh, Yakul comes with batteries included, so it comes with a large uh, standard library with a lot of things. So you can uh, have string operations, basic math, well, queries, grouping, aggregation. Uh, you can also, uh, the thing about Yakul is that it's simple and it's also extendable. Um, well, I'll get to that just in a moment. Uh, you can try and use Yakul from the CLI. It comes with a REPL. Uh, so basically, you just pip install it, run Yakul. Then you need some, uh, some data model to work on. So just load some JSON, and then you can fire your queries. And here's how you can use it from the Python. So just create a Yakul factory parse an expression, and here you go. Then here you can operate on that data that your project uses. So Yakl is already in uh, the requirements, uh, and several projects are already using it. The first one is, well, it was originally designed for Murano. So in Murano, uh, we use this as a basis for Murano PL, so actually every single line of Murano is a Yakl expression that operates on the object model. Then there's Mistral. Mistral uses it for data transformation and data flow between uh, the workflows. And then there's Heat. Uh, in Heat, you can insert Yakl expressions to make transformations on uh, the data and its templates, on the input parameters, and on the outputs. You can transform those. And finally, Fuel uh, joined us in using Yakl and uses it for uh, data flow for uh, uh, <laughs> the predicates for the deployment, so if you're a heat, uh, 
code. So if you're a, a fuel, uh, fuel plugin developer and you have a graph of tasks, you can, with, with Yakl you can set the prerequisites for this task to be run or to not be run. And that's it. That's basically what I wanted to say about Yakl. Thanks. If that was my carbon, that would have shattered. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna hear from Travis in, in now. Oh, okay, we actually have both people. And, <laughs> wow, first one. And then so we have on deck, oh man, I'm going to butcher this so badly. Uh, uh, Henrik and Raldo? That's horrible. I'm going to refresh this and hand off the mic. All right, thanks. This is the first time I felt like I was on Price is Right. Who's up next? <laughs> so let's see. Yeah, I'm Travis, and that's Matt. And we're going to talk a little bit about Searchlight. So if you look at the CLI today, what do you have? You have basically a predefined list for all the things. So I, have, I can go and ask for availability zones. I can maybe ask for instances or networks or something like that. You go out into Horizon, what do you get? You get a predefined list for all the things that somebody decided this is how you should look at it. And there's one way to do it, and you can go into your hypervisor, get a list of hypervisors, details of one of them. Maybe go to your volumes, list of one things, details of one of them. You know, kind of the same pattern. But then what about my things? Like, where's my list of things? And so that's where we came up with cloud really requires search. So what we have here, this is actually a view of the Horizon plugin for Searchlight. And the first thing you'll notice, you know, we're not filtering anything here, and you have some instances and images. But if I want to find my things, so things star, I'm going to find volumes, images, DNS records, instances, everything that has thing in it. And if I want to say, well, thing or Python, I just add Python, and now I've got volumes and images. But you know what, I really just want Python and web things. And here I have, very quickly in a quick list, I've got Im instances and image with things. And I can act on them. I can do rebooting. I can do various things. And the same thing works in the OpenStack client. So if I just want to do OpenStack search, query, Python and web, and there you go. It's the same thing. And you can see your types. There's my servers or my images or servers. And you can limit it to whatever resource types you actually care about, or you can query across all of them. So when we came in looking at OpenStack, we said, well, it's a set of distributed services. And this means you have distinct responsibilities. You have different project teams, many layers of code, different SQL databases, very little consistency of the querying. And you can't really search across these services. And so we said, you know, we're going to bring in Searchlight. And what does that do? It gives you unified search. And it's based on Elasticsearch, so under the covers we have Elasticsearch, and you can use the entire Elasticsearch API to find your things, which gives you a consistent search API across the cloud. You have full text search on any resource, search term discovery. So one of the cool things in the Horizon UI, which I didn't show, is you can click on it and say, I want an instance, and then you can click on it and say, oh, here's all the availability zones that you might want to filter on, and it finds them for you. We have auto-completion, the fuzzy search, so if you mistype security, like somebody did earlier on purpose, it'll fix that for you. So conceptually, it just kind of it's pretty simple, really. Um, basically, for listing and querying, you can query against the searchlight, and it has a set of plugins. When you make action requests, you're going against your services, and they get indexed either on demand, like as an initial startup phase, and then via notifications, we load in the incremental updates as you go. So if you make a change to Nova, we receive those Nova events. And we populate that into Elasticsearch behind the scenes. Uh, we take care of all of the RBAC for that. So in the core engine, we have zero downtime bulk indexing, meaning if we have to re-index something from scratch, you don't notice because we transparently make use of aliases and all the fun stuff that Elasticsearch gives you. We take care of the incremental indexing. That We have the policy-based access controls. There's per-user field-level data security. So if you're an admin, you can see the admin fields, like on a Nova instance, you'll see what host it's on. You can search what host it's on, but if you're not, you can't even see that. So we take care of that um, kind, of <clears throat> kind of transparently. And then the resource plugins are very simple to write. A simple one, 
generally is only a couple hundred lines of Python, maybe uh, 150, 200 lines, and it takes, just takes care of your data mapping and some of any extra resource mappings. So I'm going to turn over to Matt a little bit to talk more about the UI. Sure. Uh, I'm Matt Borland. I'm a contributor to both uh, Horizon and to the Searchlight UI plugin. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about how that plugin works. Um, Horizon in the Newton cycle introduced the concept of a registry of resource types. And what that means is that uh, throughout the UI, you can register information about all the different resource types, so like you know, OS Nova Server, OS Glance Images. And that will influence how it's displayed within Horizon. So in this case, resource types correspond to the heat types. And let me just pop over to what you can see. Inside of Searchlight itself, um, all the different data that you see in the results is garnered from um, combining the result set that is coming back from Searchlight and Elasticsearch with what we know in Horizon from the registry. And there are three basic things that the registry knows. It knows some basic metadata, like what are the names of the resources, so the fact that it's called server or instance or whatever you want. The second thing is views, the various ways in which you present the data. So if you look at this little drawer that's popping down from the server line, that's a view that's basically referring to an AngularJS template, and that tells it how to compose all the data that's coming from um, your result. And then the third type of thing that you register are actions, these things on the right where it says create image, and then down below where it says pause, Every type of resource, uh, excuse me, every resource type has a set of actions that it can use. And we actually have three different types of that. We've got ones that can be done on a per item basis. So like on server, we can pause, suspend, et cetera. We also have what we call global actions, which are um, the things that are shown at the top here. So you can create an image without having already selected one. You could also launch an instance, for example, without having selected something before. So what was really nice is that Horizon sort of allowed us due to this uh, ability to have a registry, we could actually just pl plug in everything and get everything to work. And I suppose our time is up, but thank you very much. Let me show you one last slide. Um, we have more information about Searchlight and Searchlight UI at this URL. Thank you. I couldn't stop the timer on my phone. <laughs> OK. All right. So. What? Hey, Hickey. Yeah. Okay. I, I told, I, oh, there we go. Henrique. <laughs> there we go. I can say that. Um, and then on deck, uh, we have Roman. Cool. So there you go. Take it away. Okay. So I'd just like to tell you why you should not be using the V2 API in 2016. Uh, so uh, just to be clear, we are talking about the V3 API of Keystone. That's the brand new, that's not so new version of the Identity API that was released uh, in Grizzly. So it's about, uh, it's there for three years, and many people uh, at 2016 still use uh, the V2 API, which was deprecated in Mitaka. And in V2, we have uh, a large set of problems related mainly to the global admin issue across the cloud. So if you are an admin in V2, Especially, you can assess the whole cloud. You cannot have a good multi-tenancy using V2. And although it's pretty old, it's deprecated, we still see uh, some operators on IRC, some new users trying to use, uh, and the mailing list too, trying to use V2. And we try to tell them not to, but they're, they really insist sometimes. And even though when people use more recent OpenStack versions, for example, uh, when they upgrade, the, their deployment to Mitaka, to Liberty, and they don't know, but they still use in V2 uh, internally or for the services communication. And if you're still not satisfied that you should be moving to V2, just because of the deprecation that's going to be removed, we have here some cool features that only V3 has. For example, domains that you can uh, that, that, that are now the new set of projects and users that you can have a better control of the resource in your cloud. We also have federation only available at the V3 API of Keystone, which you can, of course, connect to other clouds, to other identity and service providers. 
And we can also have a better role assignment in policy management. We have uh, inherited roles, we have uh, domain specific roles, we have domain specific, oops, that's how you smart. We have uh, domain specific roles and other cool stuff that you can do with the V3 policy sample. And Hayud is going to talk about other cool stuff of V3. So another thing that we have on Keystone V3 is the hierarchical projects, which provide the ability to create sub-projects on Keystone. We have domain-specific backends, um, which is a thing that provides the ability to create uh, different LDAPs, for example, for each domain that you have on, on your cloud. Um, we have Fernet tokens. There is a known persistent token uh, and fix a lot of things on the UID and on the PKI, PKI tokens. So it's a, a really good thing on Keystone, on V3. And we have another features, like Trust, for example. Oops. So if it works, absolutely. Um, we have V3-only gates now running across services. And uh, on these gates, we run the functional tests for, for every service in an environment when the V2 is disabled. So it's just V3 and these tests are running um, in the core services on OpenStack. And to be short, when you have to migrate now, <laughs> V2 is deprecated and you'll be probably removed on the queue release. So thank you. Okay. So we have Roman. Hi, uh, my name is Roman, and uh, I'm working on Nova in OsloDB. And today, uh, I want to talk a bit about the new engine for something and why you, as a consuming project which uses OsloDB, should care. Uh, so. The new engine for thing is essentially a new set of APIs uh, implemented by Mike Bayer back then in Liberty, which obsoletes the old engine facade. And engine facade is basically the primary interface to OsloDB uh, from which you obtain connections in ORM sessions. And th this new set of APIs was meant to fix the existing problems and uh, was meant to become be more concise and less error prone. And the key thing here is, well, the multiple improvements here is that, first of all, you get uh, free thread safe initialization, which you had to do manually back in the old engine facade. Now the imperative interface of obtaining session is replaced by declarative interface. So you can de declaratively define the scope of sessions and transactions. And uh, we have different decorators for marking of reader and writer um, transactions so that we can, for example, offload read-only transactions to asynchronous re replicas or, let's say, retry the read-only transactions on DB connection errors. So just to give you a couple of examples how the new a is API is better. So this is how the pattern of initializing of the engine facade instance used to look like. Uh, you have to, so basically you need to, you need to create an engine facade instance uh, and you have to configure it. And you have to do it lazily because by the time you create it, you might not have the config option parsed. So basically you need to boilerplate something like that. And uh, you needed to know that this, this is, can be initialized concurrently, right? So you needed to use locks. And some pro people use it, some people didn't. So in some cases it was broken, although not horribly, but still. In the new engine facade, this logic was encapsulated in the facade itself, and the interface is much simpler and cleaner. You just import the decorators of pre-created facade instance, and then you just use them to, to decorate the DB API methods that will talk to the database, and the session and connections will be injected to your context. And uh, this doesn't mean that you have only one pre-created facade. You can create as many instances as you want, let's say for complex cases like in NOAA, when you have more than one database. And you can actually, so th th this will actually use the, op but by default it will use options from uh, database config group automatically, and if you need to override them, let's say to enable foreign key support for SQLite, you can always do that by calling the configure manually. Or use the existing hooks, to, for example, to 
uh, execute these hooks on creation of an engine to enable, to allow for integration with things like OS Profiler. And uh, another pattern that was not really good in the old facade was that you had to create sessions manually and define the transaction scope with this context manager. And the main problem here was that you needed to pass the created session to other DB API methods to make sure they participate in the same DB transaction. Let's say here you create a snapshot, right? And uh, you call the another method, snapshot get. And if you forgot to pass the session object, you could easily achieve the result that the get method would not find a row in the database because it would be another transaction. So it was error prone. And we had this notion of private DB API methods, uh, which essentially started with, the name was started with underscore to denote the fact that they do not create transactions on their own, but they participate in existing transactions. So we had to duplicate every other method to have a public, public interface and private. Now it's, it is done declaratively, so you don't need private methods at all, and uh, you do not create session explicitly. You just declare, ex de declare, uh, declare uh, the transaction scope by decorating a DB API method, and uh, the session or a connection will be injected to the context object. So it's not new, it's been there since Liberty, and we have like major projects using it, like Nova and Neutron, complex ones. And uh, for some projects like Ironic, the immigration was really simple. So you should take a look at the, these examples and use it to switch to the new engine facade in your project. And uh, if you need any help, just ping me or Mike Bayer on OpenStack Oslo channel or just post to, to the mailing list. Uh, file, a, file a box if you find any. Switch to the new engine facade. Thank you. Got switched off. Okay. Um, I believe that's it on our list of the presentations that I have given to me. So thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, that's Neon Cat. <laughs> Thank you.